Uh, I'm a nurse by trade. I accidentally stumbled into the field of mental retardation circa 1965 when I got kicked out of the Air Force because in those days you couldn't be pregnant and stay in. So six miles the opposite direction from where I lived was a facility for the mentally retarded called Glenwood State Hospital School. The time I went on staff there in a facility of 1,200, I was the fifth nurse. And in those days, we told families to go away and to let their kids get adjusted. And what was really interesting uh, is that uh, one out of four of those children were dead within that first three months. So we thought it was just because they were fragile and all sorts of good stuff like that. But later, we sort of began to think that well, maybe it was because we disconnected their bond. We were averaging two to three deaths per month. And on a good day, on a unit of 35, there were two direct care staff. And they had to do uh, you know, everything. And in their spare time, they cleaned the ward. So that if you can imagine, we had a lot of different health care problems in those kind of days. And we had, in the, we had 20 wheelchairs for the entire building. I uh, stayed there for about seven years, and things got appreciably better. And in 1972, I moved over to uh, eastern Nebraska, to Omaha, to work for an ag agency called the Eastern Nebraska Community Office of Retardation, MCOR. And we brought, over the next two and a half years, all of our children out of uh, Nebraska's only facility for the mentally retarded called the Beatrice State Home. Over the succeeding period, we brought out a total of 60 children in that two and a half years. And, and within a very short period of time, we bypassed that hospital unit and took children directly into uh, alternative living units and supported foster homes. And we provided a range of clinical services. And uh, then I started to, to uh, get involved in some court cases. I moved from Omaha, which is where I lived originally, to uh, Atlanta. And now I commute a lot down to Florida. Now, Sunland is Florida's term for mental retardation facilities. Sunland Orlando was an old tuberculosis facility. And in 1976 or so, there were 1,200 multi-handicapped people in one big building. Now, what made it more unique is that a wonderful little uh, pediatrician made the decision in 69 or 70 or some time that those folks were having some problems swallowing and eating and breathing. So they simply installed tubes in almost everyone. So that there would be tubes in the belly, tubes in the throat, tubes down the nose. And uh, in 1972, a team of physicians came into that facility and 90% of the clients had one or more of those kinds of invasive procedures going on and in fact had more than all other facilities in the United States combined, and they blew the whistle on this place. So that when the, when, the, when the case was settled, myself and a group of clinicians who were occupational therapists, physical therapists, therapeutic equipment designers, behavior specialists, and myself and a nurse practitioner went in to get some of those people off the tubes and get them into appropriate kinds of equipment to help their bodies get better and or at least not get any worse. There are a lot of issues around why folks get fragile. And some of those are really emotional problems when we break the bonds of individuals. Others are things that it's not difficult to teach ordinary citizens. And the other thing I want you to hear, I hope you hear running as a theme throughout the presentation, is that a lot of these things will become problems for you if you immobilize your bodies the same way that these individuals often are from birth. When I came into the field in 1965, the prevailing attitude was that certain kinds of kids would go to hell in a handbasket, and in fact, you probably would do them a favor if you helped them along. It was back in the, the mid-60s that we were taking newborns with Down syndrome and sending them directly to large congregate care facilities. And... Uh, of course, we got some really predictable results. So that, by and large, we're going to talk a little bit about bodies of individuals. We're going to talk about something called immobility. And we're going to take a look at some patterns in a number of individuals. All right. 
<clears throat> immobility. Let me tell you about how it is with you. If we take any one of you and, and take you in for your gallbladder surgery, one of the things that nurses are famous for is going and ripping you up onto the side of the bed and making you cough against your wound when you've barely woken up, for God's sakes. And that's because if we don't make you do that, you're going to have pneumonia within 24 hours. That's how important your moving is. When we talk about individuals who are medically fragile, we're talking about a group of persons who, because of immobility, now it's amazing to me that these youngsters manage to accommodate as well as they do. Again, what I want you to hear is that if we did the same thing to you for even a couple of days, you would not survive. But it has an impact on all of these body systems, and we're going to sort of show you how the body was designed. Some of the things we're going to be talking talking about involve an invisible force that impacts on your body. That is, one of the things that causes our folks an awful lot of trouble is a phenomenon called gravity. And that means that for, for normal folks, after the age of 30, your entire body begins an avalanche to your knees. <laughs> now, gravity, therefore, is a force pushing or pulling down at 2.2 pounds of pressure per square inch of body surface exposed to that angle. You and I spend the majority of our waking days in an upright position, so it tends to pull down on the, on the stuff that's hanging off. We have a lot of individuals who spend a majority of their life behind the vertical, and the more time they spend down in these kinds of places, the more gravity hits and molds and changes because of its impact on more square inches. So that I'm going to show you a whole bunch of pictures of folks with some really severe handicaps, and I want you to know that almost every one of them was born looking like a normal child. All of these babies came in looking like every other baby in the world. All of those changes happened because of the impact of gravity on their bodies and it is therefore preventable. Now the thing that happens to a whole lot of folks, of all people labeled medically fragile in my experience, a majority of them will have had their injury around the time of birth. And 50 to 60 percent of people who are the most immobile will have serious seizure disorders. Because a lot of the drugs that we give individuals for these kinds of seizure activity are what we call central nervous system depressants. And they affect the entire body. And so a lot of the problems that we have with fragility with a lot of individuals are directly related to the kinds of drugs they're on. The 125 individuals that we had at Sunland Orlando, uh, I just did a simple, straightforward, quick and dirty survey the first couple of weeks I was there and found out that the fewest medications that any of those clients were on was five. The, the most was 12 and the mean was seven kinds of medications. And they were on multiple kinds of anticonvulsants. They were on medication for relaxation of their spasticity and many of them weren't. We're going to be talking a little bit about a number of different patterns or how people respond to this kind of static damage in the brain. Now, your body was designed to flow from the top to the bottom in, in a semi-vertical position. Now we'll go to the most important part of your anatomy for as far as your musculoskeletal system, and that's your pelvis. And I want you to feel some landmarks that are real important on the pelvis for me. Right up here on the top, where you plop your kids when they were little, right? Is something called the iliac crest. Now, if you just take your fingers and march down the iliac crest, you're going to find two bumps. You know, two still bony prominences. The official name for those two bony prominences are the anterior superior iliac spine. For our purposes, upper bumps will do. <laughs> okay, now, keep on going now, and underneath, there's a, the bone curve, mine doesn't curve in because I can't find it, but most of you have a, the pelvis curls in, and you sort of get your pelvis back like that, you can feel that. There are very few uh, nerves or blood vessels there, and this is where seat belts belong. 
And that's the seat belt on your car. That's the seat belt on a wheelchair. Because one of the things you'll notice, if you put pressure on those two bumps right up here and push back, your pelvis goes back and your spine curves forward. And a lot of wheelchairs that I see, the seat belt's in the wrong place and it's coming right across the belly button and across those bumps and pushing folks into this position so that they are sailing down into other options as opposed to what we call a real sitting. Here's a little girl who has mastered this form of responding. That is, um, what happens to kids is that they practice these abnormal patterns. It is that all of us will use whatever movement we have and we will learn to use it functionally. So this is a little girl, we flopped her on her back, she'd be in the same arch as the other guy, but now she's learned to get herself up and, to, and, and the next thing she's, she started in the process of rotating her head so she can flop over on her back. And the problem, the trade-off for that, of course, is that spasticity is practiced. It develops over time, or hypertonicity is the, tone, or is the term we prefer to use now. We're not done with the pelvis yet, however. There's another set of bumps. I want to call them upper bumps if there weren't some lower bumps. And this one requires you to close your eyes, just so you don't a ridiculous thing to do, so I don't want you looking at one another. <laughs> Close your eyes. Now take your left hand and kind of slip it under your cheek here. Now you got to sit up straight for this to work well. <laughs> slip it under this cheek here and roll around until you feel a real hard bump in there. Okay? Those are the lower bumps. you got one on each side. The official word uh, name for those is the ischial tuberosity two little extensions of your pelvis upon which you were designed to sit. Majority of folks who are, who are described as medically fragile and who don't move on their own are sitting on something else. And most of them are sitting on their tailbone. Now bone is an interesting phenomenon. I mean, it has some interesting characteristics to it. Bone will change shape under pressure. So that I, very often I'll take youngsters who have really severe spinal deformities and I'll put them prone over my lap and I will march down their spines from the top to the bottom. And your sacrum, that is that little tailbone of yours, curves forward at about 20 degrees. And uh, somehow the folks who are sitting on their tailbones all the time have tailbones that go off at a 90 degree angle because they changed shape, because they became a major weight-bearing area in sitting. This guy had some problems. He was six and a half years old at the time this particular picture was taken, and he was born on a boat uh, on the way from Haiti to Miami. And his mother had something called an abruptio placenta. And an abruptio placenta means that the, uh, <clears throat> the placenta disengages from the wall of the uterus before the infant is delivered. And so he went for about six and a half minutes without oxygen. And he was very severely, however, now hear me, that he was only wounded six and a half minutes before he was born. So he wasn't born a child with lots of deformities. This all happened because of what gravity did to his little body. So, just remembering your high school geometry, I want you to notice the angle of his facial plane to his trunk. Can you see that? Now, that's, how many degrees would you guess that is? This angle to this angle? What would you say? Almost, yeah, right around 90 degrees. Remember I told you that your Normal range of motion from neutral back here is only 45 degrees. So now he's 45 degrees beyond the normal range. Okay, now let's take a look at the angle of his trunk, okay, to the angle of his pelvis. Now I bet you that most of you think that his knees are on backwards, don't you? Those are the backs of his legs. He has gone, you've ever stood and really 
hyperextended here and really touch your pelvis under, you'll notice that you get a fair amount of pressure on the back of your knees. Same thing, it's just gone well beyond that. This is a gastrostomy tube right here. This little guy never in his life at this point had eaten by mouth. Okay, he had some other really interesting characteristics. He was one of the kids that we, uh, when our team walked into Sunline Orlando, the facility was scheduled to close eight months later. He had to leave to go into the community. We didn't think he was going to make it across the street. We had on our particular team a physical therapist, an occupational therapist, a behavior specialist, myself and another nurse, and a nurse practitioner, and, we, and a pediatric intensivist, a pediatrician who specializes in, in intensive care. And we had to sit down and brainstorm how to fix this kid. He weighed 12 and a half pounds at six and a half years of age, just a tiny bit underweight. He had literally aspirated and fibrosed, and that term fibrosis means it's like uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Only our folks get it by aspirating food and knocking out all of their lung tissue. So the other little thing that Henry liked to do was to spike a fever from, he could go from 97 to 105 in 15 or 20 minutes. What we began to notice is we began to take a look at the interrelationship of some of these things is that the vomiting episodes followed the fever or the temperature elevation uh, and, and were difficult to stop once he got up in that in that temperature range. Uh, and so he, the fever would go up and within 24 hours, he was going into periods of uncontrolled vomiting. The other problem we had is that when you, uh, if you were gonna <clears throat> lay, on, lay in your bed push your head back and arch your body, if you could even hold the position, and hold it there for that period of time, I guarantee you if you've got a bad belly, it would be gone in about 24 hours, if you could hold the posture. Because the pressure and the contraction of the abdominal muscles is incredible. So whatever went into his stomach uh, was being pushed against, and so it was easier for it to go up and it was for it to get out of the stomach. So that's where the vomiting was coming from. So the first thing we had to do was control this kid's fever. He got his temperature taken almost continuously, and any time it started up, we fixed him. The other interesting thing is that we had, uh, I want you to look at a, a youngster here who is a perfect, absolute expert manager of staff. <laughs> uh, you know, if he wasn't black, I would have thought he was Jewish. Because <laughs> he was into guilt, big time. Or Irish Catholic, my husband also knows how to do that. <laughs> so that, what you do here, you see, is you notice that this little chest here. Now, if you'll feel, put your hands on either side here of your chest for just a moment, and then feel the, the relationship of that to this dimension. Now, some, I mean, some of us with a few extra pounds may, may have that off a bit. But generally, this is about one and a half times the width of that the depth is. Mm -hmm. On Henry, the, the depth is one and a half times the width. Mm -hmm. What he managed to get the staff to do for him is to only have him on his left side. And the way he did that, is that when they put him in any other position, he went into a whimper and a cry and a pitiful, pitiful thing. So everybody said, Henry doesn't like it on there. Henry wants to be on his left side. Now, one of the things that we know about that phenomenon that we call gravity, I mean, folks, I want to tell you that it is a very powerful business. The American bra industry is making billions on it. So that it's a powerful study, and it is, um, it is, it can be incredibly therapeutic the other direction. So what we wanted was we, we decided that we were going to assume that if gravity could do this so powerfully in such a short period of time, we might be able to reverse that. Now I had a whole set of slides showing this little boy, but somebody ripped them off. But what I want to tell you is that we built him a special piece of equipment to get him belly down. Most of you, how many of you <coughs> in here are parents? Okay, 
What's the first position that you put your newborn infants in uh, when you get them home? On their stomachs. That is because that's the position that the child's going to develop from. But none of the developmental milestones emerge in the back lying position. What happens is that, that a newborn belly down comes into the world equipped. I mean, they, they have no experience with gravity whatsoever. If you've ever put a, taken a newborn baby and pulled them up from their back by their arms, you know that their heads lag all the way back. They, they cannot contend with gravity. But on the belly, they can lift that head. So that by a couple months down the road, they, they keep on stretching that head and it's some, it's some uh, wonderful little reflexes that allow them to do that. So up they come, they begin to work on rotation of the head further and further because there's lots of stuff going on in the, in the environment. Usually moms and dads are talking to them and there's noises and plops and so forth. And by one and a half years of age, they should be able to rotate the head 90 degrees to the right and left of midline. Also, but it's, as they start to push up, what they're really working on, folks, head control isn't head control. Let me tell you that. Head control is A, the head is a watermelon on the top of a long, flexible rod. It just goes along for the rod. The real issue is spinal control on these individuals. So that the first task the youngster is working on is something called cervical. This is your cervical spine. It's cervical extension. So that really head control consists of 169 about. So far it's been task analyzed that for 169 discrete steps. 169 behaviors involved in head control. So when I see that, that somebody's described as having head control or not having head control, I think the person who uh, evaluated them may not really know what they're talking about. Um, anyway, what we wanted Henry to do was to begin to work on that. His own equipment, belly down, and we gave him a piece to weight there on his forearm. Now, the biggest problem he had with this, by the way, was getting the staff to leave him alone. <laughs> it was awful. I mean, could he ever make him feel guilty? So when I think whimpering and crying, so they kept whimpering him off. So finally, we took a piece of paper like this, and we gave him a stopwatch, and we had four columns on the paper, and, and one of them said, Henry is crying profoundly pitifully, severely pitifully, moderately pitifully, mildly pitifully. We had the direct care staff sit there, and every 60 seconds we said, we want you to look at your watch and mark down which way he's doing it. What we really wanted was for them to leave their hands the hell off of Henry. But you had to keep him busy, because otherwise... <laughs> so if he wanted to work over the staff, he was going to have to turn his head that way. His head came down to neutral position from that 90 degrees back. And even if you manipulated his head, you could only get it forward a tiny little bit. So gravity in 20 minutes, three times a day over two weeks, moved that head forward and his determination to put a guilt trip on the staff <laughs> increased him by 35 degrees in the same period of time. So it's a matter of analyzing how the youngster operates. Now, so it never assume, no matter how bad the kid looks or the adult looks, that there's nobody home. So here's a really severely handicapped kid. So that when we got sort of all of those things together, we were able to take this little boy from 12 and one half to 21 pounds in three months. That's a 60% increase in body weight. But I want you to hear the term interdisciplinary. None of us had the secret to handling this kid alone. We needed every discipline, and we did brainstorming together, and we tried everything. This little boy was a real important person to us. He was kind of our rallying cry. And so what I, I had the enormous uh, opportunity to participate in a truly interdisciplinary process that in fact uh, had some really good outcomes to it and and if you've ever had the chance to do that it really is an awful lot of fun because uh, you know we just used to rip our hair out and we'd say well let's try this and let's try this and let's try that and some things work and some things don't please keep in mind the more majority of people like Henry a he would he would not have made it through his first year 
20 years ago if he would have made it through his early infant period. B, uh, <clears throat> we've got, there's a whole lot of stuff that we still don't know about individuals with really severe disabilities. First of all, the thing I want you to hear the most is that he's not, it's not too late to teach old dogs new tricks. Because a lot of you will get from some people that folks beyond a certain age with this kind of disability, the best you can hope for is that they won't get worse. Not that you might be able to anticipate that given good management that you might be able to make things better. You see, your body is a wonderful piece of equipment if you use it right. And you're never too old to make it better. 20 years ago, we used to say that kids born with cerebral palsy uh, had a 75% chance of being re uh, mentally retarded and 25% chance of being normal intellectually. In the last 20 years, those figures have reversed themselves. It is now that we say that kids born with cerebral palsy, 25% uh, will probably have some intellectual impairment, but 75% will probably be normal. And that is almost entirely due to early intervention. Uh, taking kids who are immobile and forcing them through the early sensory motor development and getting them into positions and into equipment that will allow them to explore their environment. Now, the thing that you're going to run into as case managers, folks, is that <clears throat> the training of therapists in North America is in some cases uh, a little bizarre. It is the scarcity of resources concept that a lot of us medical folks are trained to. That is what, what we're told is that there are certain individuals without a whole lot of potential upon whom resources should not be wasted. And there are a lot of folks out there who still believe that all of these youngsters that I'm, and adults that I'm going to show you are going to go to hell in a handbasket and die early anyway. This pelvis, folks, is the center of the universe. It's, it is for your posture. It is for the posture of individuals. And that's where we concentrate first. Because if we want to fix some problems with the alignment of internal body parts, we start here. Anybody who's ever clapped eyes on a person with severe disability, you, the first thing you're going to see often are the wrist deformities the elbow deformities and a lot of shoulder deformities, which you don't really see often because uh, the clothing covers it up. But then we've got hips that are dislocated and we've got knees that won't straighten or won't bend and we've got toes that point and curl in. And that's always due to the fact that the person has not been in upright standing position. It's very rare for a very severely handicapped person to be more than five feet tall, unless they are individuals with a label called apoptosis because when kids get up and they make their mothers crazy because they're bounding around like gazelles all over the place they're beating on these long bones and their muscles are pulling them longer if you have people who have not been up weight bearing on long bones and moving a lot they do not get growth in through years and that's why we have such short people they also don't have very much muscle so when they put on weight, they have a tendency to put it on between the shoulders and the pelvis. If we get them, let them get too heavy, we also inhibit their respiration. That's been a real problem. And or how, how to figure out normal body widths for folks is another real problem. Now we have lots and lots of problems with osteoporosis in non-ambulatory populations. It is not so much the calcium that is the issue in many of these folks as it is the lack of vitamin D. Vitamin D is essential for the synthesis of calcium. Calcium will not stay in the bones in the absence of weight bearing. So the issue becomes for us is getting individuals who are immobile up 
putting weight on their bones, getting them an adequate amount of outdoor exposure to sunlight. Sunlight is just, just really does just Danny. So that the techniques that we teach in terms of handling techniques and posture techniques are very simple, very straightforward, very practical, and you can teach anybody how to do them. Uh, the reason I tell you that is because there's no big mysticism here, folks. Don't let any therapists tell you that only they can know how to do this stuff. So, now, here's something really interesting. You need at least four weight-bearing surfaces in sitting. You do, I do, so do these guys. If you don't, if they can't have the regular ones, they are going to find four others. Okay, that's because the first important source of support that you get in sitting that is a partial weight-bearing surface for your body in sitting is your feet. That is part of your stability in sitting. If you move up to the pelvic area, weight-bearing when you're sitting in this kind of a position is primarily on those ischial tuberosity or the bottom bumps I was telling you about. Really, the thighs aren't all that important as long as you've got a good surface here. Now, if I turn around to the side, I need some sort of a support for my back. Probably also not as important, but there is a crucial thing missing here. And it's where most individuals, in my experience, screw up wheelchairs. And what I see happening, of course, because people don't realize that folks with uh, developmental disabilities need this, what they want to do to these guys is they put a chest support on them to pull them back. Now, if you remember Newton's law, if I'm pulling back on somebody, the, the tendency is for them to push forward. And uh, missing, <laughs> every therapist in the world has this hidden nightmare that they will open up a closet door one day and 250 sets of footrests will fall out and crush them. <laughs> because you, the staff or uh, in a lot of facilities that I uh, work in don't understand the function of those footrests, they disappear. They disappear like magic. So that whenever you're training staff or you're training parents, there are three things they've got to know. They've got to know what, they've got to know how, and they have to know why. If you don't tell them why, you will get non-compliance. If they understand the critical importance of those footrests, so that they're up, then uh, reviewing again, four weight bearing surfaces. You have got your feet, your bottom bumps, your back, your shoulder growth. Crucial elements. Must have all of those things on every chair. So the other minimum that you need is a firm seat and a firm back and never less than a 96 degree seat to back angle. It can be more than that, but it is never less <coughs> than 96 degrees. So <coughs> just in terms of postural stability and sitting, there are, uh, you know, bottom line, we teach parents how to, how to go for this. And they'll say, gee, but I thought that, and I don't understand, but I thought that. I teach families to play, oh, shucky darn. I don't know a whole lot, oh, shucky darn, but it seems to me like you got to play stupid sometimes when you're going after folks who think they know everything and don't. And they get a lot of distance out of that. So when, as long as you know what those baseline bottom kinds of issues this is what they decided to do with this little guy who falls into flexion if he, this is what I'm talking about, he pushes forward against that. And also there's some nerves up here in, right at the bend of the arm so that we can do significant nerve damage right here if we're not very careful. Next slide. This is some of the early primitive. This probably is very familiar. This is the old roll seat. Do you remember that? But at least this guy, I'm not telling, the technology's come much further than this now. In fact, we're not clamping people down this way anymore. But for God's sakes, if you're going to find folks with their ankles strapped down, it should be at the same angle as the seat belt is at the hip. It should come up and bisect the 45 degree angle at that bend. But here, this guy has got to have a weight-bearing surface for the farm. And he's got the seat belt on. We're also doing away with this by changing that seat to back angle. 
controlling the pelvis a little bit better. But the other thing I want you to hear is sitting is not the only position. Uh, and what we're looking for more and more is to give people a range of postural options across 24 hours, all of which keep them out of their abnormal responses. Passive range of motion. It's what you do when you don't know what else to do. What we try to arrange for individuals is a series of situations where they are encouraged, I won't say forced, but where they are, it's really to their advantage and, and it, it helps them move on their own. Now, if you're going to do passive range of motion, what's really important, you must do it correctly. And because you can do damage to a youngster like Paul if you don't know what you're doing. I've been in a lot of situations where folks have said, well, the only thing you can do for this person is passive range of motion and positioning. Now, I talk about something called the dead man's test. The dead man's test simply means that if a dead man can do it, it's not an objective. I can put somebody into a sitting uh, about 30 minutes postpartum, and they're going to be there three years later. Postures or positioning, as you will hear it applied to this population, refers to uh, what we call an antecedent behavior. For every behavior that I want out of an individual, I can, I can have a position as an antecedent to better breathing. I can have positioning as a as an antecedent to safe swallowing. I can have sideline as an antecedent to rolling over independently. So positioning for any individual and the consequence, uh, you can arrange whatever it does that, that gets the person to do it on their own, but positioning is never a program. Positioning is never a program. In this case, good sitting with weight bearing on the forearms is the antecedent to learning how to do an independent consecutive swallow. So that is what it takes to teach an independent, safe consecutive swallow. Think safe. Think normal adult pattern. So you see what we're going for here is always normal function. problem with a lot of our folks is because their heads are, when your head goes back like this, the tendency is for your jaw to drop down and move back. So learning how to keep your mouth shut, that's the answer to most drooling problems, by the way. If, we, if I ask you to sit here for the next 10 minutes with your mouth hanging on, you'll all be drooling down your shirt. So that the reason a lot of our folks, defecane equals drooling, by the way. Defecane and drooling go hand in hand, but keeping your mouth shut also controls drooling. So that when you get a good pucker, when you get in positions that allow gravity to help your jaw position, you often take care of drooling all at the same time. The other thing that drooling tells us about individuals, by the way, folks, sometimes it was one of the key things that tells us more than anything else that the person is really at great risk for aspiration because it sometimes means that the person cannot even control their own secretion. And, and that's where you need help to discriminate one from the other. And generally, that kind of drooling goes with individuals who are on lots of anticonvulsants. They have really, you know, swishy tone in the face. They <laughs> must keep those children off their backs at night, and preferably they would arrange to put them in a supported sideline position so that those secretions can flow through. Anything you can do to put pressure and stimulation into that tongue will, will normalize the tone. Because a lot of these kids have missed that, that ordinarily mouthing activity that kids have gone through. The way ordinary babies develop all of their ability to move their tongues is by ramming everything they can get their hands on into their mouth and slobbering and slathering and drooling on it. Nothing is safe. You know, if you've seen a baby two to three months of age, they, they catch your finger on the, on the bypass and they'll grab that and stick it in. So, so they spend literally six or seven months with oral mouthing activity. In fact, it's, uh, the, the tongue is seen by some developments that, developmentalists as the primary tool of cognition in the first nine months. 
But you, you've got to get stimulus in. When, when children get into eating problems really early, they get put on a puree diet. They never get the experience of texture. And please also remember that chewing is a learned behavior. Most infants learn to chew when they are teething because it feels so good. What our, our kids who have lots of oral motor problems bypass that because folks are scared to death to give them anything with texture. So we teach individuals how to chew. So you just have to know how to get the behavior because our mission, in order to reduce the person's medical fragility, you must, we must find ways to get kids off of that puree, I almost said a bad four letter word, <laughs> off of puree diets. And because when we do video philosophy on these youngsters, the two types of food they are most likely to aspirate are liquids and purees. So the issue becomes, how do we move up dietary texture as rapidly as we possibly can on these individuals? Um, Bruce, Bruce name, by the way, with, with her permission for me to give it to you, is Ruth Sinkowitz, S-Y-N-C-I-E-W-I-S-C-Z. <laughs> nice Irish girl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was uh, born with a condition very similar to the folks that I showed you earlier. <clears throat> Given up by her family, and the first three or so years she bounced from a, through a series of foster homes, she was admitted to Belchertown State School in Belchertown, Massachusetts when she was five years old. <clears throat> Spend the next 25 years on her back. Uh, let me show you her back real quick. Remember when we were talking about pelvic elevation? And if I gave you a number of degrees on, the, on her curve here, we, we were looking at... <laughs> but look at the mobility in that spine. Can you see how much straighter it is here? Mm -hmm. This picture was taken the day after the one that you saw previously. Now, can you also see that her two front teeth are missing? Mm -hmm. Very bit, when, in, when Ruth's childhood for youngsters with eating problems, in order to get into the mouth, they took out the front teeth. So it is very common for you to see individuals who are in their 20s. When you see the central incisors gone, the reason they're gone is so that somebody can ram a spoon in there. So that Ruth uh, was discovered by a speech pathologist when she was uh, about 25, 26 years of age. He noticed on, when he came into the unit where she lived and she was laying on the floor that every time someone came near her, she would start to blink her eyes furiously. So he started to work with her. And he started to, he established a yes, no response and then he started to test her. And lo and behold, she learned how to read in the days when we put those silly TVs on the ceiling. She learned from television commercials how to read. Mm -hmm. uh, her spelling was a bit phonetic, but <clears throat> what Howie did is he put her on a tick communicator. Uh, there's a small light beam, if you can see it, and in the back headpiece of her chair is a switch. And she simply uses that left lateral head turn. Now, this is old stuff. This so that uh, <clears throat> Ruth decided it. Well, it took her two years before she moved out of Belchertown State School. What was fascinating about this crew of people who worked inside that place, which the first time I visited there, there were 1,200 clients in 72 or 73. And now I, I suppose they're down to only about 250. But they deliberately decided that their mission, their business, was to get people ready to leave. And there was no reason why, with, why people with loose level of disability could not live in the community. So they relieved themselves of the burden of deciding who could. So it became not a, an if, but a how are we going to do this? What is it functionally that it's going to take for this lady to live in a regular kind of place out in a regular town and have access? She moved into an apartment in Belchertown, Massachusetts with another person with a severe physical disability 
she hired her own personal care attendant. And I have a letter from her describing the process that she used to hire her own care attendant. She said, she said, I don't expect other people to, to fight my battles for me, but they have to be comfortable with me or it just won't do. So what she would do is she would take the individual with her out into the community and take them into stores and see how they behaved. <laughs> <laughs> and if somebody was really squirmy about being with her, because she knew that she was no beauty, but she wanted somebody who, for whom that was, you know, not a big deal and they could be comfortable because she wants she was going to go out. The other thing she needed, which I think I met, made reference to a little bit before, is that her entire life previous to this had been the, you know, the circumference of these four walls. She had no experience. So a lot of times what we think, particularly for adults and, and individuals and adolescents, is that they just need to get out and get into a wide series of environments like you and I experience to find out what, what life is all about. So at any rate, <clears throat> this is Ruth in her class at the University of Massachusetts Amherst working on banking. And in many cases up in uh, other, in British Columbia has done a really nice job of using community colleges and peer tutoring. The nice thing about community colleges is that they're high technology anyway. They have a whole lot of computers and other kinds of things. They also have a lot of students who are training in various aspects of human services. But Ruth, in fact, is now married. This is her husband. So that the critical issue here was for them to decide up front what their mission was. And then it became a matter of assessment then becoming uh, the outcome of how are we going to do it. But you need to really think a lot about the fact that once you make the decision about where you're going with an individual, that is, if you, if you don't know where you're going, any old road will do. But once you decide what the direction is, where you want the person to be in three to five years, then it simplifies your job enormously, just in terms of figuring out functionally, how are we going to get there? And then when you run into a situation where you really are fuzzy, then assessment also becomes a real functional activity. Uh, when you're talking about really severely physically impaired uh, folks, there are no good assessment instruments. The best instrument is you and your good common sense. And so what you do is you sit, sit together and you just brainstorm. And the less structure you have, the better off you are. And that's what we really are going for when we talk about interdisciplinary process. We want your gut stuff. Remember, your degree or whatever degree you've got is your wallpaper. But what you also bring to your profession is your humanness. Some of the best stuff I've ever done and some of the people I respect the most have ever done has been using a process that I call swag. Do you know what swag is? Scientific wild ass guess. <laughs> that is when you just sort of know in your gut that something's the way it's something ought to be. <laughs> and sometimes if you get too structure oriented or too much into filling in the blanks on the form and the assessment, you miss all of that. So that you bring to your, what you contribute to an interdisciplinary process and the case manager or whatever is your parenting skills, your past experience, uh, what you believe about people and all of that kind of stuff. And that's what these folks, some, somebody gave them permission to do and that's what it made it possible for someone like Ruth to get sprung. The other thing that I used to do as a matter of, of point when I was going from facility to facility and I was working with a lot of physical and occupational therapists. I would ask them, given that they had X number here of persons with really severe disability, what would their guess be as to what percentage of those individuals 
had a lot of physical disabilities, but by and large, their intellectual capacity remained un, unhampered, other than sheer deprivation. And my guess is it has always been about 30 to 35 percent, and I really do believe it's even higher. A lot of what you're dealing with, and a lot when you're working with small chil children who are just now emerging and where they're at most risk, is that you find ways to give those children relationships and or experiences. And in fact, one of my best buddies in the business is a, the director of PT and OT at the University of Alabama who takes little kids, even when she knows they're going to walk someday, and by 18 months she has them in motorized wheelchairs because she wants them to access their environments. She wants them to explore and have experience. Where we get into a trap when you have a lot of developmental evaluations, you're likely to think that this sets where you have to go and you can't do this up here unless you do this down here. And frankly, for, um, for adolescents and young adults and older adults, an adult model is more appropriate, or what we call an ecological model, where we take a look at what it is out there that the person wants or needs to do and we figure out whether or not they have to learn how to do something or we have to modify it to get them there. Mm. But for God's sakes, don't take three years to teach a person how to tie their shoes if you can put them in Velcro. So there aren't essential steps there. And that's why I, I tell people to use these developmental instruments very mm. cautiously. But the issue being that very often we get stuck in teaching forms of behavior rather than figuring out what the function of that is in the person's life. The trap you'll get into in another different ways when, you're, when you are case managers is, let's say you're planning to bring a person back. You've got somebody who's coming out there and you've got to figure out what the person needs. You have a tendency to identify well, probably not you, but in many places, folks have a tendency to say, so-and-so needs nursing care. You are identifying the form of the service as opposed to the function of that service in the person's life. I want you to tell me about the outcomes, and then we'll worry about who's going to do it later. So the why, what is it that nurses do that other people can't do? And I'm not meaning I'm a nurse. Uh, we've been, nurses have been teaching mommies and daddies to, to stab people in the butt for years. You don't have to have a nurse to give shots, even. You don't have to have a nurse to give medications. You certainly don't have to have a nurse to give enemas. But you may need a person of that persuasion to do some teaching. But when you begin to get to outcome, a lot, a lot of you with a person like Ruth would say, she's got to have physical therapy. Why? I'm not challenging you, I'm telling, I'm asking you to figure out what the outcome of that service is in the person's life. Mostly what the person needs is to move, to have a variety of positions across 24 hours. They need to have mobility from one environment to another, and they may, may need to have that individual to train the persons who are there 24 hours a day to move joints through their full range, something like that. So that what you do often when you identify what the person needs in, in, in lieu of the, the person who usually provides the service is that you are excluding people from services. Because you don't, how many, uh, how many PTs are lolling around in most of your areas? Not very many. Not very many. The other thing that we, we want <coughs> folks to focus on is that when you look at a person like Ruth, first thing you assume is that she's a, a very fragile person. Folks, what makes people fragile is their emotional stuff. That we have persistently over the last 20 years, the biggest mistakes we've made in this business during all of this radical change with all of the court cases and all of the institutionalization stuff has been to break people's bonds. <coughs> first of all, we assume for a lot of folks who don't move a lot, that they don't have any. They don't have enough brain cells to rub together to bond to anybody else. And there are a lot of people out there who think that. So that, <clears throat> by and large, we want you to focus on the things you all know how to focus on, and that's the real human qualities about these individuals. And there is always somebody in the person's life who knows about them. That is, if 
they can get permission from someone to let it out. You have to remember a lot of families, and I'm sure you already know this, have been beaten up by the medical system. The doctors have told them to kick their kids out, go away, put them away, go have another kid, forget you had one, why are you doing this? Uh, lots of times uh, in-laws have been troublesome, everybody has battled them and nobody wants to help them. So that when they, you know, they spend 24 hours a day with a kid like that, you start to notice things about the person that you're scared to tell other people because everybody's been telling you for the last couple of years that your kid's a vegetable and that there's nobody there. And so the real human personal qualities about that person often get submerged because nobody wants, and direct care staff in, in, con, uh, in any kind of a residential situation are exactly the same way. They really know the person and they don't want, they think you'll think they're crazy because you got all the degrees, right? So they don't know nothing. Partly what I see a case manager's responsibility, by the way, is to facilitate getting out of people in the planning of programs and services for individuals what it is they already know. And to know in your gut right up that there is no mysticism about this business. It is by and large a whole lot of just plain common sense. I don't know what there is about getting a whole bunch of degrees and special disciplines, but we whack all of the common sense out of people. We, that you lose your permission to be a human being all of a sudden. And if you've ever watched somebody who bangs their head or who does other socially unacceptable stuff, I mean, you know, they're doing it for the out. There's an outcome, there's a reason there. Nobody behaves without a reason. So when you hear the term maladaptive behavior, it throws you off your feed. You think, and a lot of the world out there thinks that, that people have, have masturbation brain cells, for God's sake. <laughs> Whereas you and I have ordinary cells, or they have headbang cells, you know, or they have illumination cells. Well, I love the term maximum potential in particular. And the reason I love it so much is because it, it's beyond the pale as far as you and I. I mean, how many of you are achieving your maximum potential? I'm lucky to be tooting off at 10% most of the time. <laughs> and uh, it's it may be the best I'll ever do. Uh, I want to show you this guy because he's a real good demonstration of some of this issue around maladaptive behavior. The little guy. Now that is called a frog leg deformity pattern. Generally, it starts. This kid is real atypical, but generally you'll see this, this deformity pattern in kids who are real hypotonic. This little boy is very different. When I first uh, saw him, he was at, in the infirmary at Sunland Orlando. Now, in order to get into the infirmary at Sunland Orlando, you had to be a super sick person. He uh, was at one time pre-ambulatory. He was up on his feet, ready to walk around. He was a real emotional and fragile kid, and they put him on into a foster home place, and he'd done very poorly, and he'd, he'd gone into a vomiting cycle. Some of, some of you may have heard or used the term rumination in association with that. For some reason that I will never understand, they took this child in and did a procedure on him called a bilateral femoral head resection. And what they do, it's, it's one of the ways that they have treated uh, dislocated hips, uh, though I can't imagine why they would have done it to him because he was up walking, ready to walk, ready to let go. He was walking around furniture. What they do is they chop off the top of the femur so the, the, uh, that ball and the, the other part are gone. Well, he didn't tolerate this too well and he got more into that vomiting cycle and got to the point where he was really, I mean, physically at risk on account of it. They kicked him out of the home and transferred him back to Sunland, Orlando, where he went into the infirmary. When he, uh, he was either on his back or on his belly, and on his belly, because he has bilateral cataracts and has only peripheral vision, whenever anybody would come into his space, now he had a, you know, traditional crib, and I, I find it very functional, folks, to just go sit and watch what happens in an environment for a while. When anybody on the staff would walk across this like imaginary line, he would push up on his belly into an alert position. It's 
kind of like you've got about three and a half seconds to do that, and then you better get out, or I'm going to you know, go do something else. If they stayed too long, he'd start to body rock. If they hung in there even a little bit longer, he would turn, and he would vomit everything in his stomach right on the person. I mean, projectile. He would give it to him. Consequently, there was a sign on the front of his bed that said, don't handle Orlando unless it is absolutely necessary, sign the doctor. Well, what was interesting was why he was doing this. He was one of the kids that was going to come up on our little unit we had in preparation of getting kids back eating by now while we were waiting for them to get out. Um, we had a physical therapy team in there, and ahead of doing some work with the, that deformity, they had a, uh, a pelvic x-ray and a consultation with an orthopedist. Turns out that when they topped off, uh, chopped off the top of the femurs, they did it during a growth spurt. And so he started to grow, and he developed a bony, spiky spur on either side on the top where they had chopped that off. So when he was handled or lifted or moved, that bony spike ground into the soft tissue around his hips, and it caught, I mean, it must have been just agony for him. So this behavior was the way he kept people from touching him. It was, I mean, you know, he kept it down to an absolute minimum. The problem, of course, is that the consequence of that over time got to be pretty tough for him. One term I want to tell you about, there are two different ways that you will hear equipment described. One of these is called adaptive. Now, the functional equivalent in your life for adaptive equipment is a pair of false teeth, a gurgle. You're not trying to change anything. You're just trying to sort of replace what nature's taken away from you, right? Therapeutic in your life is a 300 sit-ups and braces. This is therapeutic equipment. It is designed with movement objectives tied to it. So the objective here is to bring those legs back to midline, using the equipment to do so. So that when you hear the terms, they're very, very different. So most people who are taking a look at the traditional maladaptive behavior label are beginning to look at that label as probably really dehumanizing and stigmatizing and to begin to do a better job of analyzing the communication aspects of behavior that you and I don't like. So that whenever somebody tells you that someone has be bad behavior, the next first question you might consider asking is, what is he trying to tell you with that behavior? Or what is it that it gets for him or her? And how, you know, because generally, if you just watch or if you ask long and hard enough, you'll find out. Because the risk you run, folks, when you take away a behavior that is the person's only mechanism for surviving a bizarre environment, is that you will get back something worse in its place. So that those kind of issues are the kind of things you run into in, in case management. They're, they're not stuff that you need super hyper clinical skills to know. You just need to get out of other people what they know. You need to get out their common sense and you need to focus on the real kinds of things about life that make you and I happy. People need stability and continuity. Remember anybody around in the days when we used to, we, we used to shuffle people through these various levels? You know, if you got this set of skills, you got to move into a, a group home. And if you got these kind of skills, you got to move into a, an, a, a staff department. And if you got these set of skills, you got to move in there. So every time you, you did something good, you lost your family, you lost your neighborhood, you lost your, you know, you know, center of orientation. So people are beginning to look at that in other ways well, too.